All right, so there will be some pull everywhere stuff in here. So case one, and again, these cases are all from my practice. Some are minimally tweaked, but most of them are real. This is a 41-year-old woman who has a three-year history of type 2 diabetes, and I'll tell you she had a history of gestational a while back as well. She has not only diabetes, but of course hypertension. She has class 1 obesity with a BMI of 32. She's been taking metformin and glipizide at those doses, and also um, ACE inhibitor and HCTZ. This is her A1C trend. She was 9.4 at diagnosis, um, was very motivated initially to improve her blood glucose control, so with metformin alone got down to 7.2 and lifestyle changes. Unfortunately, as things happen in most studies, weight loss, no matter what you do, it works at six months and the weight starts creeping back up after six months and that's what happened with this woman. Um, she got a new job, A1C went up to 8.8. .8. She was later placed on glipizide, and you know, depending on how things are going, her A1C has not been horribly out of control by any means, but she is 41. I think you're all familiar with the kind of patient-centered approach to A1C. It's not all below seven, but for this woman, clearly, she's gonna benefit in terms of microvascular complications if we get her well below seven safely and keep her there, okay? So, Um, she brings in some blood sugar numbers for you in the fasting setting. Her blood sugars are 130 over 180, which is above ADA goals. We like you to be between 80 to 130. Later in the day, variably pre-meals, bedtime, she's running in the low hundreds to as high as low 200s. Her job, she's a dental hygienist. She also teaches at a local community college, so in the middle of the day she may feel low, particularly when she's in the 70s and 80s, which is not unusual. She's gained, unfortunately, 13 pounds since diagnosis, and she's coming to you hoping to improve her diabetes care, but really also wants to improve her weight. Um, that's kind of her priority. She wants to do the best she can with both her weight and diabetes. Obviously, she doesn't want side effects, but that's not her primary concern when she sees you. She's open to injections if necessary. She has private insurance. She doesn't have a ton of money, but she's happy to pay a reasonable copay if her drug is covered. So knowing all this, um, and I'll tell you, most of these questions are open to a little bit of subjectivity. There's no one right answer for most of them. So I'm curious what you guys think might be the most appropriate medication change for this patient, knowing a limited amount of data that I've given you. Interesting. So we don't see any takers for a, an SGLT2? I, I, would, uh, I would like that. All right. So we have one taker for an SGLT2. Why would you like that, by the way? Well, um, well, let me go back. So she doesn't have underlying cardiovascular disease? No, she is 41. She has no known cardiovascular disease. She has risk factors. She's gained weight, but her blood pressure was controlled. Blood pressure, I don't know if I told you this, but let's say it's controlled. All right, and, um, I agree. It's generic, let me just say. Yes. When it becomes generic, if we don't learn of any adverse problems with this class of drug as we go along, um, I think it's going to be uh, today's sulfonylurea. All right, so our cardiologist and leader thinks that SGLT2 would be a good option, and I think that's a very reasonable option. So there's a couple of ways to go here. I'll tell you, since I was the diabetes speaker, you're probably influenced in my direction, and I would have picked probably what you guys did, uh, mainly because the, um, the GLP class, particularly the raglatide, in terms of efficacy, you are going to get more A1C reduction in general. Everyone's different than with the SGLT2s. This is a young woman where microvascular disease actually does come into play. So as A1C-centric as we're accused of being, I think this is one situation where it's really okay to be A1C-centric. Would you be wrong to pick an oral? Absolutely not, particularly for the reasons listed earlier. SGLT2 is a very nice option as well, and she might do well with that. I would probably reduce her sulfonylurea or stop it because what kind of sugars is she having in the afternoon? Yeah, so 65, 70, 80, if someone's only taking metformin, I don't really care because you're not going to go any lower. But when you're on a sulfonylurea, you're going to feel bad. She feels relative hypoglycemia. She's eating more because of it. She's probably getting rebound hyperglycemia. I think you've all known when you get rid of some of the hypoglycemia, interestingly enough, A1C can actually come down because they're not eating as much and they're not gaining as much weight. So 
I would have picked D. I think none of these are actually completely wrong. I think basal insulin I probably wouldn't do for a number of reasons, especially because she's going low. But again, it's about as well tested as you can get with the safety drug. So you have someone who needs to do that, that's fine also. Let me, let me just say uh, also, although um, I'm not going to talk about it, I would have uh, stopped the reduce of sulfonylurea and added empagliflozin, but I would have halved her thiazide diuretic as well. Excellent point. So if you're going to end, we'll, and I'll have this scenario again in someone who was started on SGLT2. Um, in that case, you don't just think about their hypoglycemics. You think about drugs that might affect, cause orthostasis, decrease blood pressure, et cetera. Excellent point. All right, so this woman actually, we talked to her about the pros and cons. She was interested in a GLP. I probably influenced her a little bit. This was a couple of years ago also, so I'm not even sure empagliflozin was an option at the time. I think we just had invocana, canagliflozin at the time. She was interested in a once weekly option. So dulaglutide, which is trulicity, was started at its starting dose, which comes in 0.75 once a week. Um, we did reduce her glipizide. We continued her metformin. Brought her in about six weeks later. Her fastings were reasonable, not perfect. Um, later in the day, she was close to goal. You know, we're trying to get folks below 130 pre-meal and below 180 two hours after meals. Still having some lows in the afternoon, not bad. She's lost a couple of pounds. She had a little bit of nausea for two weeks, but we counseled her. It will probably resolve, get through it, and it did. Um, she adjusted her diet. So we went ahead and moved to the next dose, which is the, quote, max dose of dulaglutide, which is 1.5 a week. And another six weeks later, her fastings are now largely at goal, as is later in the day. Um, she's not having any lows because we stopped her glipizide at the time. And you can argue as to whether you would have done that or not, but that's what we did with this lady. Um, she got down about 10 pounds and has a very good A1C. Um, we have about 18 months of follow-up on her. I last saw her before the Thanksgiving break, so hopefully things went okay after that. Uh, but her A1C has remained well under 7%. She's lost about 14 pounds from her starting weight. That is clearly not the degree of weight loss that's in, seen in clinical trials with GLP agonists. But remember, those folks were all washed out of their drug before they came into the trial. So this woman stopped herself in an area. She probably made some lifestyle changes, um, and she added a GLP. So she did pretty well in all counts. So what if this patient had strongly preferred oral agents? Um, as was mentioned, there's some options now. So you may want to think about um, something like a glyphlosin. Um, this is a different patient um, in whom, again, empagliflozin wasn't available then, but we added canagliflozin at the starting dose, which was in Bocana. In this case, we reduced her sulfonylurea, but also reduced her antihypertensive agent. That's kind of important, I think. More important, especially if it's an elderly patient. So this woman, she, this is actually a different woman. Um, she called three weeks later, had dysuria, urinary frequency, no other kind of alarm symptoms. Um, her primary <coughs> care doctor did see her. She lives quite a bit away from where I am. She was diagnosed with UTI and prescribed appropriate antibiotics. Those were her chemistries. Blood pressure actually was doing okay. Creatinine bumped a little bit. You know, I think we talked about with SGLT2s, initially you might see a small creatinine bump. Um, generally, it's not clinically significant. She was staying well hydrated, and that's the rest of her UA. She has glucoseuria, normal anion gap, urine ketones negative. So she wants to know, should she stop her medication? She's not very happy that she had a UTI, although now she's recovered. You ask her some more questions, you notice her blood sugars have been about 20 points lower across the board. So remember, if your blood Sugars are about 30 points lower across the board. You're looking at about a 1% A1C reduction in general, assuming your patient is capturing a nice window of their blood sugars. Um, and she's lost a couple of pounds. Okay, so two pounds doesn't sound exciting, but maybe next year when you get the obesity lecture from somebody, any little bit helps. You know, 5% weight loss is associated with massive um, medication, with massive medical benefits, even though that's not what our patients want. All right, so what would you recommend next for this lady? Um, would you stop her glyphlosin, um, check serum ketones, stop it and maybe switch to alternative agent, continue it and just make sure she stays hydrated, or perhaps go up to the next dose, because she's had some benefit, but clearly maybe not as much as you or she would like. And again, I'd say for most of, for this case, I think there are a couple of different answers we could go with. All right, so no one, no one so far has taken 
checking serum ketones. I agree. Why not? Why don't? Because we talked about this entity called euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis that occurred. No reasons to think about ketones for this lady. What do you think? You know, the main issue is she's really not having any GI symptomatology. Um, I wouldn't be convinced about her urine ketones being negative. Sometimes that can fool you, but her anion gap is normal and really has nothing going for DKA symptomatology-wise. Um, so I agree. I think I'd probably continue her medication since she's had good effect. You know, if she's incredibly distressed and very unhappy, you could offer her an alternative agent. But she just started it. It's been one event. I mean, it was a simple UTI, and she may continue to get benefit from it. You know, if she had lost no weight and her sugars weren't coming down, then you may want to think about going ahead and switching to something else. Um, but I think this is someone where choice C is very appropriate. You could certainly increase it if you want. Um, sometimes people wait till they get the first A1C. If it's someone whose A1C is high, then they'll just wait to see where the sugars are going. And if the sugars are not at goal, you can always increase to the next up dose. At the 300 milligram dose, there is a higher incidence of GU infections. So I think for this lady, I'd probably go with C first. All right, so case two, let's switch gears. We now have a 67-year-old gentleman who has a 15-year-old history of type 2 diabetes. He has hypertension. Stage 3 CKD with a GFR of 40. He has what class of obesity with a BMI of 44? Yeah, morbid, extreme, or we could just say class 3. Um, so it's BMI over 40. But it, I don't know about you guys. My EMR now prints out all my diagnoses in layman's terms. So if I put in hypothyroid, it says low thyroid. So if you put in morbid obesity, it comes out. So now I've, I'm putting a lot of class 3 obesities in. But yes. It, it's obese. Um, medications include glargine at 80 units a night, metformin 850 twice daily. This gentleman does miss his glargine a couple of times a week um, for various reasons. His A1C is suboptimal. Um, and we can talk about what his A1C should be. I don't think he's someone who you have to kill yourself or him to get his A1C below 7. But I think at least 8 is reasonable, maybe 7.5 I'd aim for. Um, checks blood glucose a couple of times a week. Whenever he checks, he's high. He doesn't notice any pattern, and he has had no low feelings, at least. Um, he's tried GLPs a couple of times. They cause intolerable nausea, and he's reluctant to add any other injections, because you do talk to him about um, other injections he could add. All right, so what would you think you would do with this gentleman? 15 years into his diabetes with suboptimal control. We could change his glargine, his lantus, to detamir or levamir. We could change it to Degladec or Traceba. Glargine now comes in a concentrated form, a U300 formulation or 2JO. You could certainly do that. Um, I do a lot of addition of prandial insulin. Nothing wrong with adding prandial, prandial insulin. Or add a low dose SGLT2. And here there may be one or two that I think probably shouldn't be done. Yeah, so I'm happy no one's picking A. Um, I, I do use a lot of Detamir. It's just that, unfortunately, in someone who's missing glargine already once a day, um, he's on a high enough dose of Detamir that he could probably, a high enough dose of basil, he could probably get away with once daily Detamir and have close to a 24-hour action peak, especially in a guy with CKD. But oftentimes, for other folks, if you're switching to Detamir, it may not last the full 24 hours. All right, so a lot of people picked Degludec. I think that's a very reasonable option. That's kind of what this case was trying to illustrate. Um, for someone who may be missing their basal insulin, who you want daily coverage, um, you want it to be a little more forgiving if you miss a dose and you take the dose the next day and still end up with the same fasting blood sugars, I think that's a nice option for him, assuming um, payment-wise his uh, insurance plan will comply. Um, no one picked, or not many people picked U300. That's not unreasonable. I mean, even though it's the same dose of insulin, say you keep telling them to take 40 units of basil, if it's a concentrated form, it does last a little bit longer. The peak is a little bit flatter. Um, but I don't think it's a huge enough difference that it's going to change this gentleman's 8.4% or 8.5% to something more reasonable. So mealtime in Prandale, there's been a lot of controversy as to how to do this, who should it be done in. I think in general, um, we, endocrinologists, I don't know about primary care doctors, I think we probably reach for it too soon. Um, and in general, I think it's because we haven't really had great options up until the last five or six years. 
A lot of times um, people are either are over basal, so the thought is reduce the basal and add some prandial insulin. But honestly, it's really hard for a patient who's already missing glargine two or three times a week to add prandial insulin. I think the best time to add prandial insulin is when these other drugs aren't an option. When you've got your basal optimized, they're taking it, you can't go further on your basal, and they have clear excursions after meals. And then you can pick your biggest meal. That's often what I do to not overwhelm the patient. For many of my folks, it's supper. And I can just add five to 10 units of short-acting prandial, if you're going to do that, rather than going to a straight QID regimen. Um, why can't we add an SGLT2 inhibitor in this gentleman? Yeah, someone hit it on the head. It's the renal disease. I think his EGFR was estimated to be 40. Um, and I think most of the SGLTs are out. Dapagliflozin we're not supposed to use under 60. Um, the others, I think 45 or below. Um, you probably aren't going to precipitate massive acute kidney disease by doing it, but the efficacy is lower, and they're at higher risk of things like dehydration and worsening of their kidney disease. So that's probably the only one I'd avoid in this gentleman, although otherwise it might be a nice option. All right, so this gentleman was switched indeed to Degladec. He was switched to the U200 formulation. Um, simply to give him even less volume. His A1C, and I'll tell you, he actually met with our diabetic educators too, which I may have had just as much an impact, but his A1C did improve to 7.8%. Um, unfortunately, his CKD progressed um, to an EGFR of 30 or 32 after a hospital stay for pneumonia. At that point, metformin was stopped. You know, he, he had been okay with metformin before. He was stable. His EGFR was 40. It's reasonable to continue metformin. I think we just felt a little more uncomfortable when he was clinically in flux. He did require his Degladec to go up to 95 units. And because it's a U200 pen, he could do that all in one shot, as opposed to having to split it up after 80 units, as you have to do for some of the other pens. And his A1C has been reasonable, um, 7.4 to 7.9, with most of his blood sugars um, below 200. And he does still have lows at times. I can't sugarcoat that too much, but um, none severe. Question? It's a great question. In the elderly with renal insufficiency, it seems like they, they like potential, though, <coughs> they, you don't have to worry too much about Yeah, so the question was you didn't include an option like a DPP-4 inhibitor. That's a great question. He could certainly have been considered for a DPP-4 inhibitor. You would maybe pick one that doesn't have one of those CHF warnings. Um, and I think probably I'd want to make sure that what the basal insulin you're giving him is actually being you know, optimized and delivered first. But honestly, even insurance formulary-wise, it'd probably be a lot easier to get DPP-4 in some plans than switching to Deglux. So I don't think that's unreasonable at all. And that might get you the half percent or whatever that you need um, without additional hypoglycemia. So pioglitazone, what do you guys think about pioglitazone? CHF, you have to be careful with. So, you know, if he were, and the people who really get extra swelling in CHF are folks who are on high dose insulin. You know, pioglitazone and insulin can really cause a little more swelling. So, nothing is 100% out except maybe, you know, metformin and the things that are contraindicated. I wouldn't reach for it initially with this gentleman. You know, if you don't have other choices, if he's got formulary restrictions and you really want to get that A1C down, it's reasonable. You just have to decide if a half a percent of A1C is worth the potential risks of. Pio, but not a bad thought either. Question. Yes. How high do you go with your basils? How high do I go with my basils? We go really high with our basils. Um, you know, again, I'm a referral practice, so we have folks who are on hundreds of units of basil. But at some point, as you know, my boss, Dr. Buse, says, you have to wonder what you're doing. You're just pouring more insulin in the patient. I don't know if you guys have patients where you give them your titration, they do 70, they do 75, they do 90, they do 120. I've seen people go from 120 to 122, to one, which is so funny when you start you know, titrating at those numbers. And at some point, you just stop seeing effect. You don't know if the patient's not taking it fully or if they've saturated what they can take volume-wise. Um, but there's no upper limit on how much basal insulin you can use. You know, if it's working and they're not having adverse effects, hypoglycemia, the problem is if you're using very high doses and they're not getting efficacy, they're paying a lot of money. Um, for a drug that's not working. So you have to think about sensitizers, you have to think about the newer agents, um, you have to think about compliance. Obviously, we all have those patients who are on massive amounts of basal insulin, they're always high, and they come into the hospital for some procedure to be NPO for a day or just eat a hospital diet, and they're just plummeting, because then you know they're just eating constantly at home. A lot of those folks end up going to gastric bypass now when, if they truly have insulin resistance and they're not responding to your... Do you find yourself 
Yeah. yeah. So the question is, so the question is about a vicious cycle. If you're increasing insulin, are they going to be gaining more weight and then you're gaining more, giving more insulin? Absolutely. That's not all patients, but if you see them enough, if you see when you've increased the dose, their A1Cs come down and their weight's up 10 pounds, then there needs to be a little timeout discussion as to what you can do next. Yeah. All right. So those were diabetes. At the end, if there's time, I'll go back and do any more diabetes questions that you may have. Let's move on to bone. We have a 56-year-old white female who has low bone density. She underwent menopause four years ago at what's really the average age of menopause in our country, right around 51 or 52. She weighs 124 with a normal BMI, although sometimes when I see these BMIs, I think people are anorexic I'm so used to seeing high BMIs, but that is normal. Um, she has an unchanged adult height, so she hasn't shrunk. She's been taking a proton pump inhibitor for reflux and has been, had difficulty coming off of it never smoked, um, no other personal risk factors for bone disease. Mom fractured a hip at age 84. Sister has breast cancer that's been treated, doing well. You get some baseline bone labs, um, calcium, creatinine, phosphorus, all those things are normal. Um, she's been screened with a DEXA scan, um, and I'm not sure the reason of screening, I think someone else screened her before I saw her. She is postmenopausal. Maybe her weight influenced someone. Maybe the family history of hip fracture. It was not, I don't think, unreasonable to get a DEXA scan. And those are her scores shown there. That's her T-scores at the lumbar spine, the femoral neck, and the hip, respectively. So what's her radiographic diagnosis? Osteopenia. OK, so these are just names. They don't tell you what's going to happen to your patient, but we have to name things. So this is osteopenia because her score is between a minus 1 and a minus 2.5. You typically pick the worst score to decide what your patient has. You can say, you know, if she had a minus 0.9 at the femoral neck, I guess you could say she was osteopenic at the spine and, quote, normal at the femoral neck. But the skeleton tends to be a systemic process, so we kind of pick the worst and go from there. Okay, so what do you think might be the next best step for this 56-year-old woman? Um, with osteopenia. We can repeat her DEXA scan at age 65, or this nebulous or earlier if indicated. Um, so you can stop her PPI and repeat her DEXA sooner, see if that had effect on her bone density. You may want to turn to your FRAX tool. Um, you may want to treat her with any one of these agents for a couple of years and then reassess her risk. And I'll tell you, in this situation, I've seen pretty much everything done, and I can't say any of them are, are wrong. Good. I like to see a nice play there. So again, I don't think any of these are particularly wrong. I do think that even if you do A, B, or D, you ought to at least do C and estimate her fracture risk. Um, because if somebody is osteopenic, um, you don't really know that much about their fracture risk. The FRAX isn't going to tell you everything. It is just a tool. It's just one more tool we finally have in our armamentarium to advise women what you should be doing. So I think you should at least establish a baseline estimated risk with the caveat it may not be 100% you know, accurate. And you can do everything else. If the woman is really averse to drugs, she's active, she's healthy, you don't think she's going to fracture no matter what her scores look like, you can try repeating in a couple of years. You may not be able to stop her PPI because she may need it. Um, and honestly, you can argue, is she going to get massive bone density increase from stopping her PPI? I doubt it. Um, it may have contributed to some degree, but I suspect she has a genetic component and she's lost estrogen. That's probably the biggest reason this woman has low bone density. I probably wouldn't rate till age 65 to repeat her BMDs. A couple of folks asked me after the talk yesterday, how often are you rescreening people if you decide not to treat or if they don't meet thresholds for treatment? That's a really tough question. I think most of us have been driven by Medicare. We just do it every two years because Medicare lets us do it every two years. And that's probably not the best way to practice, but we all do it. Um, in general, data has shown, coming out of UNC, a family doctor, Margaret Goulet, I don't know if anyone knows her or has um, seen her data, but in 2012, she published a really nice study in the New England Journal showing that women who were over 65 at the first time they were screened, so not this lady, um, who had normal bone density, so minus 0.9, 1, whatever, it took 15 years for like 1 to 5 percent of those women to actually change into a range where you would treat them. That doesn't mean they won't fracture, because as you get old, sometimes you just fracture. But it meant, do you really need to waste your time and her slightly extra radiographic you know, exposure to check a bone density in three years 
five years? Probably not. So if someone over 65 who's kind of already had all their postmenopausal bone loss, which happens in the first few years after you lose estrogen, if they're normal, you're probably not going to see anything besides normal if you rescreen that person in a few years. So are you going to wait till that woman's 82 to screen? I don't know. But the recommendation is every two years is probably unnecessary with someone who has totally normal bone density. Now this is a little bit different. This woman is just a few years postmenopause. She has osteopenia, but she has what's called you know, severe osteopenia. If you want to get even more nitpicky, minus 1 to minus 1.5 is mild osteopenia. 1.5 to 2 is moderate. Minus 2 to minus 2.5 is severe. And it's just like with those TSHs, you know, the closer you get to worse, the greater your chances for spilling into the treatable category. So there is no one evidence-based guideline to tell you how often to screen younger postmenopausal women who happen to be screened and aren't yet treated. Um, but I'll tell you what I did. Um, and I do think that we would go ahead and estimate her fracture risk. So this is just, I think this is her frax risk calculated for a US Caucasian. Um, if you put in her weight, age, and all her other criteria, her parent did fracture a hip. So she comes out to those scores. A 10-year risk of having a, quote, major osteoporotic fracture is 15%. And the 10-year risk of having a hip fracture is 1%. So does she meet criteria for treatment based on FRAX? I see here some no's. So the answer is no if you're just going by these numbers. Doesn't mean you can't treat her. Um, major osteoporotic, the threshold has been set as 20%. Hip fracture threshold, 3%, because we really care about um, avoiding hip fractures. And again, I encourage you to play with some of these numbers, and you can see how much it changes. The TBS is a trabecular bone score. Has anyone heard of a TBS? Yeah, so these aren't routinely being done. Some centers, like Columbia, the big bone centers are doing them. It gives you a little bit more of an idea of what that trabecular bone looks like. So remember I said we can't really measure bone microarchitecture without a bone biopsy or fancy MRIs? Well, this is one way to get at that issue. And it probably predicts fracture risk as well or better than bone density, particularly when used together. So TBS will probably be coming down the line for all of us. OK, so that's her risk. So here's this woman again. We recommended, oh, question. Okay. If you have the same patient 10 years from now, and it's 2.2, so now she's in her 60s. Yes. So what would you do? So that's a great question. He says, you know, this, that was a hard case because she's, you know, four years postmenopause. If you have a minus 2.2 and she's 66, what would you do? I would do the same thing. I'd plug her into FRAX and see where she comes out. And I should have probably done that because I, I keep telling you guys I should look and see what weight. And that would probably tip her over one versus the other. Um, and sometimes I'll do that. The woman will ask me the same thing. She's like, so how bad do I have to get to qualify? I'll say, well, you don't actually have to get any worse even. You just have to get older. And we just plug her in at 60 and 64 and 70. And I tell them the guidelines might change by then too. Um, but it just gives people an idea you know, of when you'd meet those set criteria for treatment. But I agree. My young postmenopausal women who have bad scores are my hardest patients to treat. because It's like a 19-year-old you know, with an LDL that's really high. You know, for me, that's hard to treat, especially um, the diabetics that I see. And the hip fracture risk uh, over 10 years, what is the critical number that you look For the hip fracture, 3%. 3%. If you exceed 3% risk, it, then the recommendation is to consider treatment. So there's a 15% estimated risk of this person having a major osteoporotic fracture in the next 10 years. So that includes wrist, spine, and all sites that are considered for delivery size. criteria for treatment. You just look at the hip. You would look at that, too. If that met 20%, that would be criteria for treatment. Exactly. So sometimes they line up, and sometimes in older folks, the hip is exceeded well before the osteoporotic fracture was succeeded, which is kind of interesting. And for younger women, it's the opposite. The major osteoporotic usually succeeded before the hip is exceeded. Question. With, uh, the question has a couple <coughs> of questions within it. One of them was her sister had breast cancer, and that would push me to maybe considering a serum to treat both things. You guys are so good. So the, que the thing was, well, the sister has breast cancer. Maybe it'd be a nice way to treat her with the serum, off-label, but knowing that there's good data that may prevent invasive breast cancer as a woman. So I think I actually addressed that in a future slide. 
Um, but that's a good thought as well. She's kind of the perfect patient to think about that in. So this same woman, we did go over her calcium vitamin D requirements, which she was meeting through largely diet um, and sunlight exposure. Asked her to continue or increase her exercise, including weight-bearing activity. We talked about falls precautions, not particularly relevant at her age, but she still were, you know, there's still things she can avoid. Um, at that time, this is a while back, I think, but we did recommend just repeating her DEXA in two years. I was influenced by the fact that her T-score was so close to osteoporosis range. I thought she was still losing some bone density in the menopausal years, and I thought it might change my treatment. And she was okay with that. Um, so in the interim, she develops a new diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis, um, and she unfortunately has several courses of glucocorticoids um, to treat her, not continuous, but to get her stabilized. She came in, I just can't remember whether this was two years or earlier or, or after, but in any case, a couple years later, her DEXA scan looks worse. Her T-scores are kind of either osteoporosis or severe or osteopenia at all sites. We did do a VFA, a vertebral fracture analysis at that time because of the steroid use and because she was relatively young, it was negative, because that certainly would have tipped me over if she had an occult radiographic fracture. Um, so at that point, we did recommend starting an osteoporosis agent because she has osteoporosis. She's changed a lot in two years, and she may be getting additional steroids for her rheumatologic disease. Um, we chose IV, sildenafil, just because she had a history of GERD, um, and she wanted it for convenience. But we did consider, we had a discussion about raloxifene, um, given her family history of breast cancer. Um, but because I really was worried about hip fracture in a woman who's getting steroids all of a sudden, I think that tipped me towards considering bisphosphonate. Um, but without the glucocorticoid history, I think a serum would have been actually a nice choice for her at that age. So she did improve her BMD. Young women especially, when you put them on bisphosphonates, if they don't start going up a little bit, there's something going on. Um, sometimes in our elderly, less ambulatory patients, even stabilizing BMD is success, and you're going to prevent their fractures. But I do like to see BMD go up. Um, she didn't fracture. She didn't lose height. And thankfully, she was able to be taken off of steroids with alternative agents. Um, this is a lady who um, we continued her bisphosphonate for five years. I might have, in current day, I might only continue it for three or four years because I'm giving her IV, and she has a good response, and she's young. But at that point, we did it for five years. And then we've been following her out, and she's been stable. She hasn't lost bone yet, um, and she hasn't fractured. Question? Concerning the VDIs, uh, you've been modifying your recommendations on calcium supplementation. <coughs> That's a good question. And maybe I should. The question is, you know, based on the fact that she has to take a PPI, would you modify your calcium recommendations and have her take more than what's recommended? Is supposedly calcium citrate. Yeah, so, and would you recommend her taking calcium citrate as opposed to calcium carbonate? Because calcium carbonate does require a little more acid in the stomach to be absorbed as opposed to citrate. So the citrate piece I do recommend. I'm glad you mentioned that. I can't tell you I have hard data showing that it improves bone outcomes, but in terms of absorption, it is better absorbed. Um, it tends to be a little more expensive in over-the-counter forms, but not much. Um, so I usually, in this woman, would recommend at least 1,200 milligrams a day, um, even up to 1,500 if you're concerned she's not absorbing it. And up until 2,000, it's been considered to be fairly safe in terms of renal outcomes. It's a really good point. Okay, any questions about her? Yes. So for the younger females, yeah. Yeah, so the question is, this is a young woman, you know, how soon should you be screening people? So again, for people under 65, it's really up to you and your patient um, because the recommendations are pretty nebulous. You know, there's not just a couple of clicks marks you check and it says yes versus no. I mean, the recommendation is between age 50 or between menopause and 65, screen anyone who you think has a high risk for having osteoporosis. So again, very easy if this woman had been on steroids for 15 years. I think everyone would have screened her. Um, less easy if she just happens to be white with a mom who fractured at 84, but otherwise fine. You know, so I mean, my job is more luxurious in that I'm not usually having that initial conversation with the patients. My primary care docs are doing it, and they screen them, and they need help, then I get to see them. So I think it's a very difficult choice in women. Uh, you just have to think about the fact, in my opinion, are you going to treat that patient if you find osteoporosis? Um, 
and I'm not, I wouldn't necessarily treat every 51 year old one with a T score of minus 2.6, and I don't. You know, if they otherwise look fine and they don't want to be treated, we just monitor them. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we should phone a friend because I've talked to a number of your colleagues who actually are managing this. What do you do for anyone you want to get IV zoledronic acid? So he arranges it with his infusion center. And I talked to two or three other folks here who are routinely doing that. I think that's the most common thing I see from primary care docs. There's no reason you need to refer to an endocrinologist unless you want to or have a management question or just maybe that's just one thing you don't like to manage. It's totally up to you. But if you are happy to manage it, you can just arrange it with your infusion center. The subcutaneous would be a problem because we can do that or they Yeah, the subcutaneous like um, denosumab, I think many primary care docs who do it are comfortable doing it in their office. Okay? All right. All right, so here's another bone case. This is an el older person, not elderly, but older than our previous patient, 63-year-old man with osteoporosis. And this is kind of a weird case, but I'll tell you it's all real. This is a gentleman who presented to his primary doctor with mid-thoracic back pain. He was putting away laundry a couple of weeks ago and it occurred suddenly. He rested, he stopped running, this is an avid runner, um, and he took some NSAIDs, still having pain. So when you see him or somebody sees him, his exam shows one and a half inches of height loss from last measured height. Um, he has mild thoracic kyphosis, no tenderness. He's thin, he's lean with a BMI of 20. He looks normally virilized. And I'll tell you, he has had biologic children. Um, he has two centimeters of gynecomastia bilaterally, and he has 15 cc soft testes. Um, so not terribly small. You know, anything between 15, 20 is, is normal. They're not small and firm, which is kind of your concern for primary hypogonasm, which this gentleman didn't have. Um, on radiology, he has a T4 compression or wedge fracture of his spine. This is not him. This is just a picture I took from the internet. Um, these are just pictures of compression fractures of the lumbar spine. Um, there's one at L2. That's more of a crush-looking fracture. Um, they can look really dramatic if you see them shortly afterwards. Um, so if you move on with this gentleman, he had no smoking or alcohol history that was significant, no family history of bone disease. He did have kidney stones last about a year ago. He's an avid marathoner. He's lost about 20 pounds in the past couple of years um, on purpose, much to his wife's distress, um, but he's happy with it. Um, he's had decrease in libido the last couple of years. And so this is a gentleman where, you know, there's a lot going on. I think it's reasonable to do more labs than less labs. Because he'd had stones, we did a 24-hour in calcium. Um, anything over 350 to 400 in general is normal, although oftentimes you have to correct for how heavy the person is, three to four. Uh, milligrams per kilogram per day. His morning testosterone was, there's the T everyone was asking about. So his morning T was 190, which is generally low. Um, you know, anything under 300, some societies considered to think about being low. I find that a little bit of a dangerous cutoff, to be honest, when you get into very elderly populations. But, you know, under 200, I'll agree that's low. 220 was the second check. His prolactin, thyroid labs, gonadotropins were normal. Nothing else stood out. His T scores are in the osteopenic range everywhere. Um, we did do the distal one third radius, the wrist, because he had a history of kidney stones. I was concerned maybe he had hyperpara, which he did not. So he just got everything. And so this is a gentleman who um, we think has secondary osteoporosis, not primary osteoporosis, as in the first case. He probably has some degree of hypogonadism. I don't think it was lifelong based on his history. I think it's probably related in some degree to his weight loss, but we'll never really know. I can't remember if I did a pituitary MRI in this guy. I don't think I did. You know, anyone under 50, um, if they have inappropriately normal FSH and LH, probably deserves an MRI unless you have a good reason like narcotics, et cetera. Um, over the age of 50, there's that lovely, you know, uh, term called ADAM or androgen deficiency of the aging male. So that's a whole two more lectures. So I'm not sure who really deserves pituitary MRIs. I don't think I did it in this gentleman. He has hypercalceria and he has relative undernutrition. You know, this is not an anorectic gentleman, but he is really um, pushing himself to lose weight and exercise. So we recommended testosterone replacement. 
I told him he may not need it always. You know, he actually may improve his own access over time. We recommended a thiazide to improve his hypercalceria. Um, number three is something I never, ever recommend to anyone. So it's kind of fun to say, don't move as much and try not to lose as much weight. Um, and I actually talked about osteoporosis medication because I thought he may actually be at risk for fracture in the next five to 10 years. Um, I didn't sh show you his FRAC scores here, and I honestly can't remember whether he met it, but he had so many secondary factors going on that I wasn't sure FRACs would adequately reflect him and his risk. So he was happy to take testosterone and take the HCTZ. He did not want to modify his activity. This is someone who really liked his ability to run. And he's still walking or running a lot. Um, he took oral alendronate for three years, and he hasn't fractured at all. Um, he did not want to get any more DEXA scans done. This is actually a, a gentleman in the medical field who, found, who just felt there was no reason to do it. Um, I did check bone markers in this gentleman because he wasn't going to let me do his BMD again. So someone asked about when do you check bone markers. So I was just kind of curious, had he actually taken the medicine? Was it absorbed properly in his urine NTX, which we checked before treatment was high? It was very low afterwards. We like it to go down by at least 50%. Um, and then he's been stable otherwise. So I'm just kind of crossing my fingers. I'm not sure what's going to go on with him. I'd love to get one more bone density scan at some point. Um, but I suspect we've definitely decreased his risk of fracture. Okay, so I didn't put that on there not to remember everything, but just to get you guys to remember to think about secondary causes in folks who don't 100% fit the picture for someone who should develop osteoporosis. Yes, sir. Yeah, so it's a great question. If you do check bone turnover markers and they're really low, like 5, 10, extremely low, are you concerned about this, this um, entity, which is no longer called this, but it used to be called frozen bone. That was the concern that you're over-suppressing turnover. And is that going to put you at high risk for ONJ or AFF or of something else? So there's no known correlation between bone turnover markers and people who are at higher risk for bad outcomes, meaning kind of like, I don't know, I'll have to defer to Dr. Um, basal here, but kind of like bottoming out LDL. Like, I don't know, uh, you know, is it bad to make bone turner markers too low? We do sometimes in the past, particularly when we just had bisphosphonate and forteo as our two big things to use, if I wasn't sure which way to go, I'd sometimes see where bone turnover markers would be to help me decide which to go with. Not evidence-based stylistic doing, but I'm not aware of any um, data showing that certain threshold of BTMs will get you into trouble. Yes, ex exactly. So, and it's and so it's not even just osteomalacia because osteomalacia actually means demineralization of bone, which shouldn't happen with these drugs. But you're right; there is evidence on bone biopsy that the bone is not turning over as much. But we, we know that when we give bisphosphonates, you know, that we do that also. So I don't know in the long run if it would help you, and I don't think it would be wrong to use them in that sense. The flavor of osteomalacia that was on the bone biopsy doesn't have to be demineralization. It was actually the, the bone was, was not working out. Yeah, so the microarchitecture was disturbed. Yeah, but it's, it's a really good point because we have to think about long-term consequences, and I just don't know clinically if that's helpful, but we use what we can. So if that would help you, I don't. it's certainly not wrong to do. Question? Before you started testosterone, what did you counsel him? Before I started testosterone, what did I counsel him? What do you guys counsel folks before you start testosterone? BPH can get worse. I hear something. I hear some sleep apnea can get worse. Prostate screening. So, you know, I don't have to have that discussion with folks about whether they want PSA screening or not, but when I start testosterone, I do screen for PSA. You have to look for the rate of rise. So, those are the main things. And older gentlemen, if they're over 65 or above, I don't use injections anymore because I just have seen too much erythrocytosis with that. You have to use kind of small doses. But I have men who have been on injections forever and they like them. They don't want to go to gel. So, we'll use it. We just have to. But that's the number one risk, honestly, of all these things we counsel for and folks who are over 65, the risk of erythrocytosis actually exceeds all these other things that we talk about. But you have to counsel about those three or four things that we mentioned. How long do I continue the testosterone? So if I think that there's a potentially a reversible component, I wait until that reversible component is improving or until the patient just says, I want to see if it's doing any better. So the biggest reversible component in my practice is diabetes, obesity, 
et cetera. I mean, that is really bad for the LH axis. So people who have lost weight, whose diabetes is controlled, I say, why don't, and who had T's in the 200s, you know, 240, 250, not bad, who've had kids, those guys can recover. And so I usually wait a year or two and say, let's try to wean it and see how things are doing. If they've been on injections, it can take a little while for the axis to recover. And those of you guys who are treating people who still want kids, be really careful, because the sperm count takes a long time to recover. The number one cause of young male infertility in some urology practices now is treatment with testosterone. It takes a while to recover. So some of our urologists are using clomiphene, which is off-label, instead of testosterone to naturally get, quote, naturally get the pituitary to wake up. Um, again, maybe next year's talk. But th they're great thoughts. I, I don't like treating testosterone. There's, it's difficult. Yes? That's a great question. Why not consider Forteo? And I have used Forteo in patients like that before since he, did he, he, did not, he had a f clinical fracture. Exactly. So he actually didn't want Forteo. We did consider he didn't, But there's no reason not to. He had not low T scores, but he had a lot of risk factors. He had a clinical fracture already. Um, but he had a lot of reversibility to it as well. I guess my whole thing with people who have had their first fracture is Forteo for now, we've got two years of it. And this is a guy who's already, he's only in his 60s. And I have reversible things I can reverse. I have a drug of bisphosphonate, which I can use and get 50% fracture reduction at the vertebral spine and 30 to 50 at the hip. And there's no time limit on that. And it may linger in the bone for a while. So I personally like to use Forte in a situation where I don't think the person has a lot of other good alternatives to improve bone and who are severe. All right, so let's try and get through the last two cases. A 70-year-old man with unusual thyroid function tests. Um, did I skip something? Okay. So he's known to have BPH. He's had multiple recent UTIs. He comes in with essentially urosepsis to the hospital, briefly needs pressors, develops AFib on hospital day two, placed on low molecular weight heparin, um, had also been getting some sub-Q heparin just as prophylaxis. He did start amiodarone, but just got his first dose before labs were drawn. And because of the AFib, his TFTs were appropriately checked. It's okay to check TFTs in the hospital sometimes. And that's what you have, a TSH that's low of 0.13. Free T4 and free T3 are also low when checked. So my question is, there's a bunch of things that could be causing this guy's unusual thyroid function test. Which do you think it might be most likely? Um, euthyroid sick or non-thyroid illness, his amiodarone, his heparin, maybe he's developed central hypothyroidism. Go back to the labs, absolutely. Well, let me tell you, TSH is 0.13, which is low. Normal is about most labs, 0.5 to 4, somewhere around there. His free T4 and free T3 are both listed as a little bit low, whatever the reference range is. <coughs> and in this case, there's two that would fit the lab picture, and all four of these things can obviously cause weird thyroid function tests. Okay, so non-thyroidalness or euthyroid sick can, I'll just say, can do anything to the TFTs, anything. But the most common thing you see, especially early on when people are sick, is lowering. The first thing that happens typically is the T3 falls from lower free T4 to T3 conversion. Um, TSH also falls, maybe due to circulating cytokines and a bunch of other reasons. And at some point, free T4 may fall, it may be high. There's lots of things that can happen with free T4. But generally, TSH, T3 are low, and often T4 is low. Because he's been sick, I think non-thyroid illness is probably the most likely thing that's affected this guy's thyroid function test. It kind of looks like central hypothyroidism, which is why the labs could absolutely fit choice number four. I mean, that's what happens when you have a pituitary surgery, your TSH goes down, and then you don't make as many thyroid hormones. But we don't have a clinical history for that. At least I didn't give you one. Um, amiodarone, even, I'm not sure how much one dose could do, but let's just say at a couple of doses. The normal thing that amiodarone does, remember, is to cause the free T4 to go up because there's less free T4 to T3 conversion. So in the first few weeks of using amio, that's the picture you're going to see, a higher free T4 with a low T3. And the TSH either is the same or will go up a little bit. So that's the first couple of weeks of months of amiodarone therapy. So his labs, unfortunately, or fortunately, didn't fit amiodarone lab effect. And then what does heparin do to thyroid labs? Which, which number goes up? If I tell you that heparin causes increased dissociation of thyroid hormone from its thyroid binding globulin. 
Excellent. Free T4 goes up. Um, again, not clinically in the patient, but when measured, um, it's a binding effect that occurs. So you can often, if you happen to check free T4, you'll be stuck with these funny labs. Normally, the TSH is normal. Free T3 may be high also, and free T4 is high, and he didn't have that lab picture. But you could certainly you know, invoke heparin as a cause of weird TFTs in the hospital. Okay. And I will say, you know, sometimes life doesn't mirror the textbook, so people can have TFTs that don't fit any pattern, in which case you do what endocrinologists do. We just repeat labs when we're not sure what's going on. Um, case 5, 70-year-old gentleman. Um, oh, same guy. Um, endocrine evaluation, again, did not go for central hypothyroidism. He was improving with his supportive care, normal thyroid exam, so we did just recommend outpatient follow-up. And so he, interestingly enough, there's his baseline labs that I showed you in the hospital. He continued taking the amiodarone for his heart. Two weeks later, his TSH looks like it's recovered. His free T4 is recovering and now looks a little high because he's on amiodarone, which makes sense. No one's worried. Three months later, the free T4 goes into the normal range and the TSH stays just a smidge high, which we could just leave alone unless his cardiologist wanted me to treat him. But then at six months, he develops probably true amiodarone-induced thyroid dysfunction. He has a high TSH, and he has a free T4 that's pretty darn low for someone who's on amiodarone. Um, normally, those numbers are well above one. And he has some symptoms that may or not be coming from his thyroid. So we ended up just treating him for amiodarone-induced hypothyroidism with a low dose. Um, and he's kept his TSH in the normal range. Okay, So that's just supposed to remind us about amiodarone and being in the hospital. Last case, 28-year-old woman who has elevated antibodies, thyroid peroxidase antibodies. Um, she has hypothyroidism in her family, both mom and sister, which is why she wanted to be screened. Her primary doctor only wanted to check her TSH, so she went to an alternative health practitioner who was found to have normal TFTs again, but she had elevated TPO antibodies. Have any of you guys ever checked TPO antibodies or seen ranges? So normal and labs are considered like 0 to 30 or 0 to 35 in most labs. So you can go as high as a couple of hundred. They can be listed as over 2,000. You know, people can have high titers, so they get scared when they see those numbers. So she was placed on armor at half a grain or 30 milligrams a day. And this is a very rough estimate, but it's almost the same as levothyroxine 50 micrograms. There's no strict conversion. So her TSH goes down, which is not surprising. The rest of her labs look kind of like they would look like when you're taking armor. She looks fine on exam, and you know, we actually advised her to stop her armor. She had lost three or four pounds. She was happy with that, but she wasn't sleeping as well at night, um, so there was really no reason to continue it. She normalizes her TSH. We're happy with that. You know, I think I mentioned yesterday in your young women who are considering conception or actively trying, it's important to keep their TSH normal because Baby has no thyroid gland for the first 12 weeks and is relying solely on mom's thyroid hormone and advised to notify us if she gets pregnant. <clears throat> she does get pregnant, and this is an important one. Her TSH, when she comes in for her first early um, visit, and not even to her OB or her GYN, um, her TSH was 3.9 at five weeks gestation. It was 1.6 preconception. This is still totally normal. You know, by our lab, I think, well, by our lab, it's slightly high, but by most labs, this is still normal range. So why do we start levothyroxine so early? Remember, you know, HCG starts to go up really early in pregnancy. By the time you hit 8 to 10 weeks, HCG is out the roof, and that normally cross-reacts with the TSH receptor and causes a woman's natural thyroid to become more active to account for baby's needs. If someone has a little bit of hypothyroidism, they may or may not do that on their own. The thyroid may or may not respond. I've seen a lot of cases where TSHs have been three and a half, four and a half, and the recommendation is, you know, we check in four to eight, six weeks, which otherwise is totally normal. But by then, the woman's 10 to 12 weeks pregnant, and the TSH is up to 15. Um, and can I tell you that's going to have some long-lasting, profound impact on her fetus? No. Um, most of the studies that show that early hypothyroidism impacts fetal outcome and even IQ at seven years later are people who are fairly hypothyroid and untreated throughout pregnancy. So this is not, in my opinion, malpractice or alarm stuff, but it's just something to know. The TSH will go up a lot if you don't treat it now. So she was started on 50 micrograms a day, did fine during pregnancy, stopped it after delivery because we weren't sure she would need it since she had such mild thyroid disease. And now she comes in two months later. She's losing weight, fatigued, having tremors and palpitations. 
There are her vital signs. And on exam, she has nothing going on with her eyes. Her thyroid is smooth. It's a little bit small. There's no thyroid brewery. So I don't know if anyone has heard of thyroid brewery. It's really easy to hear in Graves' disease. That's it's pathognomonic for Graves' disease because it's just extra blood flow over the thyroid. She um, has some tremors. Her labs show hyperthyroidism. TSH is low. Free T4, free T3 are both high. And this is two months postpartum in a woman who previously required a little bit of levothyroxine. <clears throat> so I think this is my last poll everywhere question. What do you think is the most likely diagnosis in this woman? Um, could she have postpartum Graves' disease, thyroiditis? Does she keep a stash of her armor from before and she's restarted it? Um, and is her residual estrogen from pregnancy affecting her numbers? Excuse me. Yeah, so, you know, I think you guys are reflecting very well what I'm thinking. I think it's either one or two. If she had surreptitious use of armor, it's possible, but I don't think her free T4 would be that high. It's possible. We can't rule out number three, but she, she looks pretty hyperthyroid. And then residual estrogen effect should not last this long. She's two months postpartum. And the excellent point is even if it did, it wouldn't elevate your free T4, absolutely, and it wouldn't decrease your TSH. All it would do is increase your total hormones. Yes, there's lots of reasons D is wrong. So I think it's most like she has postpartum thyroiditis. About 7% of all women develop postpartum thyroiditis. Most of the time it's not diagnosed because, you know, you're losing a little more of your pregnancy width than you thought. No one's super upset about that. Um, they're tired. They're a little anxious, and it kind of resolves in a few months. So people don't often come to the doctor, but if you just look at labs of women, about 7% of all women, if you look at women who have underlying autoimmune thyroid disease, whether I had a history of Graves and it was treated, I had a little bit of Hashimoto's and used to be on levothyroxine, it's a much higher percentage, and I don't know the numbers for that. So she's probably having a thyroiditis. She doesn't have a big gland like a Graves gland. She has no brewery. She has no proptosis. So it could be either, but I think it's probably postpartum thyroiditis. Graves does occur more often six, in the first six months after pregnancy because you're losing that autoimmune suppression of pregnancy. So a lot of autoimmune diseases can flare in those first six to 12 months after you deliver, including Graves. So I diagnose a lot of Graves in women who are a year or less out from delivering their baby. So we did thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin in her. You could also do a TSH receptor antibody. It just depends on what your lab likes. Um, we deferred an uptake and scan, which would have been the definitive way to say if she has Graves versus thyroiditis because she was nursing. Um, and I don't know, if you take care of nursing women or have been a nursing woman, it's, it's pretty sad to tell a woman to like pump and you know, dump for three days so they can you know, get rid of the iodine and the scan. So I just avoid doing that to women if I don't have to. Um, she was prescribed a beta blocker just for symptoms. And there's her lab trend over the six months. So at two months postpartum, um, or two months later, she, her free T4 was high. At, actually, I think that was at presentation, sorry. And at three months, she started to recover on her own because we decided she probably had thyroiditis. Her TSH was coming up, her free T4 was normal. And as you see over time, her TSH continues going up. Now around three or four months, I offered her a low dose of levothyroxine. I said, you know, 20% of folks are gonna need levothyroxine indefinitely after thyroiditis, but 80% of folks recover. Um, there are some protocols that say just treat everyone with 50 micrograms when they enter the hypo hypothyroid phase and take it off later. She didn't want to be on medicine if she didn't have to, so we just kept watching her, and she kind of settled out at seven months with a TSH of 6.5. She actually felt fine um, and didn't want to be treated initially, um, but before she was trying to conceive again, I advised that she restart levothyroxine. She required a higher dose in the second pregnancy. Usually you require about a 30% increase of your levothyroxine dose in pregnancy if you're someone who's taking levothyroxine. Um, and now she's 100 micrograms, not pregnant anymore, but it seems like her thyroid has progressed in terms of hypothyroidism. Okay, so there's a lot of little nuances there. Just trying to get you to think about thyroid function tests in pregnancy, um, the issue of thyroiditis and how to treat that, and then the fact that thyroid hormone dose should be increased in pregnancy. What made you check her TSH when she first got pregnant? What made me check her TSH when she first got pregnant? I have to go back to that case. I don't think she was. She was oh. I mean, you knew she had TPO antibodies. She had been briefly on some armor thyroid. I mean, 
six, but before pregnancy, everything is normalized. What made you? Think? Yeah, so before pregnancy, everything normal. Why even check her TSH? Um, the question is because she had a history of mild hypothyroidism. Well, does she have a history of mild th Oh, TPO antibodies. She had TPO, she had TPO antibodies in a family history. So the question is TSH screening in women in pregnancy. There's been a lot written and looked into this. You know, the, one of the biggest databases was out of the United Kingdom, and it was a, quote, negative study, meaning screening women with TSHs didn't seem to impact the outcome. But these screening studies are all flawed because they check women at 12 weeks when things are kind of a little bit late at that point. So there's no um, great evidence that screening improves outcomes for mom or perinatally, but there's definitely a higher risk of overt thyroid dysfunction in pregnancy in folks who have underlying autoimmune thyroid disease. But if, she had never had that if she had never had that check, nobody would have ever had that check, which is why thyroid groups think that all women should be screened with a TSH, and everybody else thinks that's overkill because you'll be finding things that may not you know, improve outcome. <laughs>